John Wren and Chris Wren, his grandson, is with us. Chris, uh, stand up and take a bow tonight, the Wren family. Just amazing benefactors of the Collingwood Football Club. Good on you, mate. And Jock McHale passing a week after our win. And uh, Stephen, I know you're about to ask Ronnie some questions, but it's uh, understood that uh, the, on the Thursday night before the 1953 grand final, the coach was Fonts Kine. But uh, Fonts was late coming in for the meeting, and it was actually uh, Jock McHale who put Ronnie on the wing and demanded that he play there, put the name up, and walked out the door, and that was it. And Ronnie was on the wing and was best on ground. Well, Eddie, um, I just talked to Ron. Of course, Ron would have won the Norm Smith medal had there have been one in those days. Uh, Ronnie, after your best on ground performance, John Wren came in. Did he give you the big handful of notes? No, miss me. Damn. <laughs> I was a little guy. I was a little guy, so when he came in with a handful of notes, he couldn't find me. <laughs> he could, I didn't get it. <laughs> Where'd you go after the game? I know these days you would have come back here to the Palladium Room at Crown and Collingwood have, would have had 1,800 people here. What did you do after the game? Well, we had a drink with the players and then we left and went to uh, a place out at Heidelberg, a dance place. I think it was, a, I think it was, it was Heidelberg, wasn't it? Glen Ferry, near enough. Let me, <laughs> Louis, I want to start off with you because you kicked one of the most historic goals in history to open the game. That's right. How far out were you? Impossible. The angle, I know the angle was impossible. How far out were you? About four metres. <laughs> <laughs> Louis, after the game, I know after the game we've seen the famous photos of you being carried off and some idiot decided to piggyback you to your car. I did hear it. Probably catch that bastard or kill him. <laughs> well, he dropped you, did he? He sat on a bloody bottle and fell ass up a turkey. <laughs> I, know, I know it's a family thing, but everyone says Ronnie was best on ground. Was he? Easily. Good. OK. <laughs> I'm moving you forward. For Christ's sake, keep the brake on. This could be bigger than Sam Newman on the footy show if he goes over the edge, I tell you. Murray, you came on at three-quarter time. You were 19th man. You were just a baby. What were Fonce's instructions? He said to, I said to him, I said, Fonce, what do you want me to do? He said, just run around the ground. I was a pretty fit kid at 17 years of age. and He just ran around the ground. And everywhere I went, the bloody ball fell on my arms. And the first kick, the first kick I got, Lou was just there in the centre of the ground. I said, Lou, what do, you, what do you want me to do with the ball? He said, kick the bloody thing as far as you can. <laughs> but it was, it was just a great thrill just to get on. And, uh, do you remember much of it? No, I, I think the excitement got me at the finish and I gave away my socks and shorts. Because and, I rode the bike to Fairfield. Yeah, we know the story about no, the tell bike. Us, tell well, the story. Can tell we have the story, story about the tell bike? Us, the okay, okay, you rode the bike. Well, I, I didn't have a car and no one picked me up and mum and dad went to the footy. They had to get there early, they had no seats and that. And, and I rode my bike to the Fairfield Railway Station, put me, parked my bike there and jumped on the train and went down to the first ga uh, gate and the bloke said, oh no, he said, players go in around the corner. I walked in the dressing room and big Jim um, Phelan was there standing with congratulations. I walked in the ground, no one said a bloody word to me and I thought, Jesus Christ, I, Am I really at the right place? So anyway, I sat down, put my mum, packed me bag and towel and jock strap and socks and I didn't have a jumper and the black walked around. He said, here's your jumper. I had Neil Mann's jumper, number 16, which was a grade three. His mother blew his nose from Lou's head. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I had number 16, Neil Mann's jumper, which was a great thrill because I watched, I watched the 45 grand final at Carlton in the olden days and all that and Neil Mann was just one of my heroes, so I was just, it was a, a big thrill and Neil was in the game and I, I can remember, I, look, I've got to tell this story quickly. Uh, George Hams and I were sitting there in uh, 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 the Toomey, uh, Pat Toomey rolled his ankle. And of course, I'm a half forward flanker or a centre half forward and Kine and the Gordon Hocking and the, and the selectors looked down and said, Hams, you're on. I said, this is not fair. He's a back pocket player. And, you know, I'm 79. I thought, Jesus, that, that's... No, you've got to change this. You can't do that anyhow. But that's just one of the stories. Of Murray, I know we could go on with this for a moment. Tell us about the Sheila in the forward pocket. Well, I had no one to take to the function that night. Did you take her? 
Yeah, of course. What was she like? She's good. Okay, okay. enough. Okay. <laughs> Brian Taylor would have asked a more embarrassing question. Arthur the Butcher. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right. <laughs> Birthday. In those days, everyone had a trade. It wasn't like today where they, um, they just turn up. No, that's right. Do you work on Saturday morning? Yeah, it's Saturday morning up till about 12 o'clock and sure, try to get home in time to have a, perhaps a bite to eat. Do you have I, a shower? No, oh, I don't even know whether I had time. <laughs> so you turned up with a bit of blood on the, uh, on the sleeves? And... Oh, yeah, not quite as bad as that, but uh, uh, we weren't far from the ground and I used to, uh, I was staying at Collingwood at the time and walked through to that uh, Victoria Park and... Uh, it was a great experience, but uh, there's a bit of a story, you know, when it comes to the 1953 Grand Final. Uh, I shouldn't have actually played in it by rights, because 1952, when we played Geelong in the second semi-final, I rolled an ankle. And uh, it looked like I was finished for the 1953. And uh, luckily, living uh, close to our uh, family doctor, he uh, said, I want to see you. So he, he took me up to, into his uh, lounge room after he finished work, after he finished his surgery, and he went, to, he went to town on my ankle. Well, it was like a football. It was blowing up. And uh, I only had 10 days then to turn around and get back onto that Collingwood uh, track to have a chance to play in the grand final. And I couldn't believe it that uh, I went over there and he, he even came over to watch me train. And he gave me a bandage to put on my ankle. And I put, I put it on and I went in, I put it on too tight. I cut all the circulation off my foot and I hobbled around the, I hobbled around the ground and there was only 3,000 watching us train. And he turned, they turned around and said, well, he's finished. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't quite satisfied with that. I was working close to the ground and my mate Frank Tuck, we were both butchers and uh, in Victoria Street, Collingwood, and I said to Oh, yeah, going back, I jumped it a little bit. I went and took that bandage off my ankle, come back out again, and it felt a lot better, and I kept running around the ground. By the time uh, I finished training, I was feeling pretty good. So on the Wednesday night, I said to Frank, I said, will you come over to the ground with me? I think I might, we'll go over and have a kick and see how I go. So I went, I went over there, Frank, you know, he should have played in the 1953 Grand Final, but playing, playing against Footscray a week or two before those finals, he decided to have a three-rounder with Jack Collins of Footscray. Quite costing four weeks. Uh, Arthur, I tell you what, I'm not going to go on with this, but I tell you what, I saw you walk in tonight, the ankles come good. <laughs> I reckon 60 years on, the ankles come good. Georgie. How brash was the 17-year-old weed? Well, let me uh, picture what it was like then. We're sitting on this bench in the Collingwood hierarchy. Who was on the bench with you? Well, Murray and I, yeah. the, the coach and uh, the president. And that was normally a quota. But the Four pretty handy names. Yeah, but the other officials could see a wind coming up. And so by the time... I was asked to go, to go on the ground, we were sitting in a heap and I stood up and I, I wished uh, Twiney had sent Murray on then and not me because I was aching all over. <laughs> aching all over. Mick, good to see you here, mate. How's Portland? Not too bad, pretty good. Wandered up, did you? Just strolled up the highway? Yeah, I drove down here to, you know, five hours these days. It used to be... It used to be three and a half. That was before they put those speed traps in. Um, family name, some famous family names, the Roses, the Richards, Panhams, but the Toomeys are right up there with the very best. Oh, it's very good to say that there. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's history. <laughs> oh, fair enough, yeah. I'm, I'm not a very uh, talkative man these days. No, 
Oh, well, that's okay. There's no one, they're all listening out there. You're just a couple of pearls of wisdom and, uh, and we'll go on with the next course. But it was good playing with the boys in that, in that match. Ah, oh, yes. I think the 50s, I was very fortunate to play all the 50s. And the, it's a marvellous thing that the, the players of that era, or my era, the 50s, they're still all friends, you know. So we, were, we all got on pretty well together. And, and nine of you still around? That's not bad, is it? We're all getting on a bit, but... Well, you look around here, I reckon they look all right, Mick. There's, there's only two wheelchairs and, uh, and four of you have got a bit of a limp up. But this guy here looks as though he could play tomorrow. Thorold, it is wonderful to see you. I remember watching you on Channel 2 for year after year. I used to appreciate your comments. You've got a great knowledge and love of the game. Pal, I, I was very fortunate to be kept in the game for as long as 15 years with the ABC, 11 as a player, and then uh, six years on the board at Collingwood. And then Eddie has the temerity to ask me to be on the Hall of Fame committee with, with Kevin Rose. And that kept me going for 50 years in the club. Kevin, I saw Kevin down here before. You guys will both be in this. No worry about that. Do you vote for me and I'll vote for you? Oh, and how? <laughs> Just finally, before we go back to Ed, a concise, clear memory of the game. Beating Geelong, they'd won two in a row. They were red-hot favourites. Um... Just the thrill of it all? I think the, uh, the killer or the killer blow for Geelong was placing Ronnie Richards on the wing. He took my position on the wing and I was thrown onto the half forward flank. And uh, Fonts said to me, and probably to other players as well, just keep running, run all over the ground. You've got a raving commission. Well, I was buggered at the finish. <laughs> I had the job of uh, minding Peter Pianto and he was the fastest man in the Geelong team. But uh, Ronnie played a star of the game and uh, he well deserved his best on the ground. Ed, they talk, they talk about this bloke. They say when he came from Cobden, he could stab past a pallet of wheat up a, a chook's bum from 25 metres and not ruffle one feather. That's exactly right. Mm. There's one word you made an error in then, uh, Jack. And Luke coined that phrase. It was, could kick a pellet of wheat up a chook's ass. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> Folks, they are the champs. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the 53 Premiership team inducted into the Collingwood Hall of Fame.